right, and welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Chef Ryan Butler from the Willing Brewing Company, and we just had a fantastic meal of ribs, yeah. chicken, steak, two kinds of potatoes, uh, broccoli, broccoli, which is for being broccoli, it was incredible broccoli, um, and then um, there was was the reverse Scotch egg. Reverse Scotch egg was uh, was there, yeah. That was kind of cool. That was yeah. a new invention. And I've, I've never had a bad meal uh, around you. In fact, uh, anybody that's listening, if you have a chance to uh, become friends with the incredible chef, I highly recommend it. Uh, you end up eating <laughs> lots of good meals. Lots of good food, <laughs> man. It's always around. So I, I, uh, I think I was, I can't remember who I was talking to, but I was telling them that you're going to come on the podcast and how... Um, whenever we get together, the topic always comes around to food, but not in an annoying way where all you, in fact, mm. we, we talk about food, but it's always something different, um, because you're just passionate about cooking. Yeah. yeah I just dig food, man. And it, um, started really early as, so it's just kind of part of my language. It's part of my lifestyle. Um, I was brought up around good home cooks and mom you know, let me do things in the kitchen when I was young. So I developed a, a respect for the kitchen because it is a dangerous place. Right. <laughs> and uh, just learned how to do things the old fashioned way. And when you love something, it be, and it's, it's, you love something your whole life, it becomes just part of who you are. So that's why every, every conversation in one way or another touches on food at least once, so. Yeah, well, and, and um... The, the diversity of your interest in food, too, I also find interesting um, because it's uh, different cooking techniques from from the, we've had conversations about the dehydrator and then smoking meats and, and different, and you smoke more than meats, which is incredible. Oh, yeah. Uh, smoked fruits are amazing. Uh, I've done smoked strawberries and, you know, everyone strawberries are real delicate you wouldn't think that they would hold up in a smoker but if you do it right it ends up being a smoky sweet little treat that you could eat by itself or on a charcuterie board with some cheese and some nice hard you know sausages or whatever or you could grind up and put on a pork chop on the grill it's just it's its own barbecue sauce at that point it's amazing uh the, the one thing i i always tell people when we talk about your cooking or when i talk about your cooking um is uh, the one time I came into your kitchen and you had a smoked duck egg yolk and it tasted like cheese. Yeah. I'd uh, never even heard of such a thing. Yeah, you can cure egg yolks. Um, what we do is we separate them just like you would for, you know, making custard with the yolks. You'd separate the whites out, and but you can't break it. So you lay it in a bed of spices and salt and cover it up and you let it cure till it draws all the moisture out of it and you rinse that off and while it's still wet from rinsing it off, I put it in my smoker and then for fully dehydrate it. So there's really, it, it becomes almost like a stained glass window pane. Like you can see light through it, but it, it ends up being like a, a smoked Gouda and some people have described it like um, bacon and eggs in one bite. It is, it really is. And, and I'd never heard of that before. Did, is that something that you kind of figured out on your own? Did you see that somewhere? Or? Uh, I saw a very, a much simpler version of it online, and because I follow as many chef sites as I can, as many cooking anybody that's talking about cooking on a regular basis, I'll I'll check you out, see what you're talking about. Um, but somebody had done it in just sugar and salt, and then they dehydrate it in the oven, and I was like, you know what? We could do the same thing, just a little bit. A little bit further outside the box, you know, which is basically where I like to be culinarily is outside of people's comfort zones. I, I, I like to work on the fringe. Every every time I come back in the kitchen and, and you show me something, it, it's something new, and it does seem like like you're always pushing the limits and 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 you're taking what's been done before and you're combining uh, things that in, in ways that I've never really thought of before that I've never seen before. Um, that I think that's what in my mind, takes you in a different level from just a great chef to being a real food artist. It's, it is fun. It's, um, as I've educated myself in the kitchen, um, I've learned the flavor profiles of certain cultures work with the flavor profiles of other cultures. 
and then some things that you wouldn't think would work together at all end up taking your taste buds on a totally different journey than you ever expected and you're like well I have to have this case in point is uh, we were messing around in the kitchen and we came up with what's called paradox pasta because it really shouldn't work but we take Italian cheese filled tortellini and we toss that with our house made kimchi and slow roasted slow smoked pork shoulder with some soy sauce and we put it together in a pasta and you to talk to a chef a classically trained chef they would say I was outside my, my mind yeah. on that but if you taste it just have an open mind because that's what I beg people to do about foods just have an open mind just try things you know step outside of your meat and potatoes step outside of your chicken tender salad and try something different so but we did that pasta and I sold through pounds and pounds of it in one night because once someone tried it, they told everybody else in the restaurant that came in, try this, you know. It, I, I tell people all the time, the most unique dining experience you can have in, in the High Valley is at Willing Brewing because the, the, there's nowhere else that you can get anything even close to the kind of food that you guys are serving. I know other restaurants have the things that they <coughs> specialize in and they may, might make a great burger and they may even have an item that you can only get there. but. Literally, you're always coming up with new dishes, and it's always stuff that I don't think there's anywhere on the planet that you can get <laughs> a lot of the dishes that, that you make because well, thank you. they're I unique to that. you. And um, I mean, that's like one of the, the hidden gems to me of the High Valley uh, is you doing that and, and other people doing um, really unique work that you can only find here in, in the High Valley. It's a nice time to be an artist in, in Wheeling. Is especially in Wheeling right now yeah. because the upswing in center market is amazing. Um, people are, you know, trying new things yeah. and they're appreciating different viewpoints of certain things. And they're ex uh, like one of the best compliments I get on a regular basis is you're the chef. You have the weirdest menu we've ever seen. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. That's yeah. amazing. That's exactly what I wanted because if you like the stuff here, you have to come here to get it. You right. know what I mean? That's right. You can't get it anywhere else. Yeah. And I think you are um, bringing some, <coughs> some new flavors to people that, that they're not used to, like kimchi. I like it. Yeah. Um, and it is totally an acquired taste. It is. It's an acquired smell, for that matter. Um, if, if someone who didn't know what they were looking at, you know, looked at it and smelled it, they would swear to you it was bad. Right. But in a controlled environment, with somebody who knows what they're doing, you can take nature's natural process and kind of put it to work for yourself and then turn out something that is just it's fun to make because you know you're, you're taking all these raw ingredients and you're you're mixing them up and adding different things and then at the end result is something completely different than if you were to just take a mouthful of it at the beginning like it's you know time has to help with that it, it yeah it, the for i like fermented food fermentation man it's it's really fun it's really fun it, it you're right it's it it takes time to, 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 to de develop those flavors. A lot yeah. of things, if you want to do it and, you know, respect the process of the food, really respect Mother Nature. Um, a lot of people that I've seen try to add so many ingredients that you really don't know what you're dealing with at the end for the end result. Yeah. I would much rather keep the process simple, keep it true to what it used to be, like curing ham which is one of my new hobbies that I really yeah. enjoy. Um, really fine-tuning that as far as uh, culinary skills. But um, doing that takes a couple of weeks. Sure. At least. You know, we do, a, we do a simplified version of a country ham, and we smoke it through the smoker, and it comes out, and it's amazing. It's just, you know, they're just waiting for it as part of the build-up to tasting that ham at the end of it you know you know you, you know day one you put the rub on it oh and in two weeks this is going to be delicious you know and and <coughs> any more that level of patience is just not something that that people are uh, that well at, at accomplishing and for you I, w I would imagine that because it takes two weeks you kind of have to know what you're doing mm. Because um, whereas maybe you're making a soup or something, you could dip a spoon in it and see how it's coming along. You kind of have to know when you're going into yeah, it you're, what you're getting it, into. People ask me, how do you get this, this stuff to taste like this? 
and with ham, I messed up a lot of right. ham. I turned a lot of really delicious pork into really expensive fishing bait. Yeah. And it catches fish wonderfully, but you couldn't put it in your mouth at all. Like, right. a human couldn't take it. So well, I've learned a lot, you know, messing up stuff. That's, sure. and you know, that's why I feel confident and now I can look at what what it's doing and go that's that's right you know well uh, i know some of the some of the smoked things that i've had that you've made that that you not only got it to to where it was edible but you really went a step further and dialed it into where uh it's your sister's graduation party i forget what it was but it just melted in my mouth it was it was oh we had um, um duck i believe duck breast i had some there but basically you could take any you know, I like I like the more palatable fatty meats like pork fat and you know duck yeah. is amazing. But if you render if you cure those down right, and then put that through a slow smoking process and you know really take your time with it and put really care about it really like just love it and, it, and it'll turn out something that's you crave that you know people come back and they go oh do you have this because I've I've been thinking about it I'm like yeah, yeah. we'll do that you know have you noticed that that because people have come in and tried a dish that maybe has a unique ingredient that um, it's it's opened their mind up to trying more uh, to, to be a little bit more open-minded towards whatever you have that oh, I didn't think I liked that the last time so um, throw me something unique and, and they've kind of broken out of their mold. Oh absolutely I mean from from day one you know when I took over I'd, I I kind of pre-warned everybody like hey we're doing things that is, are, are different so you're going to have to explain the menu a little more yeah. you know, we're going to have to have a little more in-depth conversation with the customer find out what they want but as far as people trying things they've been really receptive and now I have people that just come in and well whatever the special is I'll take that yeah you know, whatever you guys are doing today we'll they we'll trust eat, the chef yeah we'll just eat what and I also have really close people who have eaten at restaurants that I've worked at in the valley that have just followed me that they'll just come in and see that I'm working, and they'll just, hey, hey chef, feed me whatever you want. Yeah. Let me know the price. Thanks. Isn't yeah. that like the highest compliment a chef can get? It is really great to for people to just come in and say, I don't need to know. Whatever you put whatever. out in front of me. Yeah. yeah, and there are certain customers I know what they like. I know what they're allergic to, and yeah. I give them what they want. So, yeah, you're going to come back. You know, if you can get especially that personal relationship that I, I know that I'm feeding these people and giving them something that I love to do anyway and they really like it like so that's that is the best thing as a chef and is to have people really just trust your judgment and it's I think that's uh, uh, you don't see that very often anymore you don't you don't, you, you don't I, I know most of the places you, that I go even places that I like to eat I don't really know who's cooking the food mm -hmm. and I, I may really enjoy the food and might be some place to go all the time but um, that's probably something unique, at least for the High Valley, is a restaurant where it's really the, the it's driven by the chef. Um, I wouldn't say driven, but uh, at least, well, the food experience is not so much driven by the chef, but I like to lead people in certain directions, you know? Right. And kind of, you know, and as far as who's cooking there, there's only two of us. Yeah. My sous chef, Audrey, does a wonderful job. She really makes it. She made it, I, for the first month I worked there, I didn't have any help. I had the, you know, the owners would help me out. They've been really great to me. And uh, so I hired Audrey and she kind of gave me the freedom to expand on, in certain aspects of the kitchen. Sure. You know, cure the egg yolks. We pickle our own vegetables and eggs and all kinds of stuff there. Um, without her, I couldn't have the freedom to do that. Right. So, but she does a great job. So there's only two of us cooking there. So. And it really, you have to be there because it's not like somebody could come in and 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 really do what you do. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it, I I'm actually you know it's it's nice to have help for sure. Sure. Um, I am very active as yeah. an executive chef because there are only two of us. Yeah. So we do our own prep, we do our own cooking, cleaning dishes. You know, we have help with dishes on occasion. Um, so, so because because not to pick on Applebee's, but you know, one night Lou could be cooking your food, the next night Bob could be kick, cooking your food, and you wouldn't know the difference. But if Ryan's not in the kitchen, then this, I know to a certain a, extent. To a certain extent, exactly. Yeah. Um, Audrey does. I give her freedom when she's working to do specials, and her specials sell out. 
That's so she gets the she, she kind of she gets freedom like, too, and it's a it's that's a, great. It's a good thing as a chef, a working chef that if you don't have freedom to create, you get burnt out real quick. Yeah. So, um, but as far as knowing who's in the kitchen, you can you can tell certain things because we have our own style. But being an artisan kitchen, that's there's sort of a little leeway there because usually a, a, a kitchen is supposed to pump out uniform cookie cutter meals right. all the time. Um, but we have a little more freedom. We have a, a certain wording in our menu where we can alter things to what the farmers have or yeah. what we can what we can get from this local vendor or what we can get from this local person. So we can plug that into our menu at any time and, and keep it fresh. It, and that's one of the things that uh, we've talked about many times is that, that you're really big into farm to table and local ingredients. And um, so kind of explain a little bit um, why that's important to you and, and, and what, what exactly that means to you. Well, um, as a you know kid growing up in this area, hunting and fishing was a big part of my life. So that's where I learned where you know, my food comes from. You know, it was much, it made much more sense to me to go get a deer during hunting season that has been eating, you know, nuts and berries and foliage all, you know, all right. year and getting healthy and there's no chemicals in it. You know, it's, it's a healthy animal. It's happy. And it's happy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I've gone through the commercial end of restaurants and just seen the, the prepackaged canned goods that everyone's just guzzling down. Yeah. And I'm, you know what? It's, I would much rather have a personal relationship with the guy who's growing a hog that I'm going to serve in the fall and wait and do that pork in the fall when that pig is when it's supposed to be you know dispatched right you know instead of these you know i'd rather have a happy pig and a happy cow than those ones that are caged in and boxed in that's not healthy and it and it definitely affects the uh the the way the food tastes oh yeah you can taste you know if an animal was happy or not yeah you know, it's the, the adrenaline and the fear that goes through those animals on a daily basis when they're caged in like that's not good for that meat at all. It, uh, and I, it, the, the antibiotics and all those other things are, yeah. are, are probably the thing that people that think of, that are conscious of the, what they're eating. It's probably the first thing that comes to mind, but it is. There's a certain thing that, that happens when... Yeah, when that it, animal's pumping adrenaline and scared to death and... Yeah. And then it gets dispatched right after that, and then they package it up and send it to the grocery store. You know that taste is in there. You know that that I'm a, you can almost taste the fear. You, yeah, I would much rather have an animal that was raised on natural things in a pasture and had its freedom. You know, yeah. let it take more time to get to the size it's supposed to be than to pump it up and get it that fast when it's young. You know, it, it definitely. Uh, my feeling is with food, the the closer it is to the way it is in nature. Mm -hmm. the, the better it is and um, I, I've had a complete 360 on hunting in, in the last few years where I think because I eat meat mm -hmm. I like meat um, big workout guy now and, and super into eating healthy food and um, for me I have to have protein and the only way to get enough is through meat and I'd rather eat meat of something that lived free like you said mm -hmm. and ate natural whatever it, whatever was whatever natural it would, to it, it. Would eat, yes yeah. And, and um, that deer's not going to live forever. And the, mm -hmm. and the reality is that it's, if, if it's not taken down by a hunter, it's either going to starve to death um, or it's going to get hit by a car by and a vehicle, suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if we don't keep these animals in check yeah. by eating them, they're going to destroy themselves. Yeah. You know? and there are no retirement homes for, for deer, and uh -huh. they also don't live forever. So. Yeah, they don't have an adoption process yeah. for old, old uh, does and bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, so eventually... All of them are going to die, yeah. and they, I think, you know, a quick so, death. You might as well enjoy one with some apples, some grilled apples, <laughs> right. and some potatoes, right. you know, and some fresh vegetables from your garden. Yeah. I would much rather enjoy a deer like that than see it hit on the highway. Yeah, where it could uh, lie uh, starving in a ditch for yeah. uh, three days while wolves uh, or coyotes yeah. eat its butt. Pick at it, yeah. Pick at it. Yeah. Um, 
so I and, and I know I'm a gardener and uh, so are you and there's just nothing like a tomato from the garden versus one that you get at the store that's that was ripened in a truck yeah. on the way to the store yeah, yeah. and that's that's made to be mm-hmm. uh, to survive the shipment from California to sit yeah. on the shelves yeah the tomatoes that I grow if I pick them you have to eat them you have to relatively eat them. quickly yeah. because they don't have a long shelf life but you don't they don't usually have to sit on the shelf because they're so delicious they're so delicious exactly yeah. and I like being able to plant a special over what I got an abundance of in the garden. Like, yeah. oh, we're going to have a lot of beets. We're going to do a beet salad at work, you know. Or, hey, I need some basil for this sauce. I'm going to take it from the garden today, and it's going to be in the saucepan tonight. Yeah. I, I think uh, your culinary skills has to make being a gardener that much more enjoyable because a lot of times I'll grow things, and I, I, I kind of prepare them in the same way. But, it, man, if I knew how to take it, more advantage of the things that come out of my garden the more i learn to do as a culinarian the more i want to just have a farm and not have to go to work just yeah. working on the farm would be my job and if i had animals in a garden with vegetables with the knowledge i have i could turn that into a product that i could sustainably live on the whole year sure so you know the more i learn in one it makes me want to learn more in the other and it benefits to them more than the other because then you can cut out the middleman and do everything yourself. <laughs> That's right. Well, and, and I think um, what's nice about that is it's it's not that you're saying, oh, if I learn this, I can make a lot of money, or but but you just have a passion for <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, no, I just want to learn how to do it so I can do it and then do it all the time. Then right. I don't have to depend on somebody else to do it for me. You know, if I can if I can grow. Um, pickles on the vine and put them in the brine and you know have pickles for the whole year then i don't have to go to the store to ever get pickles i have them in my cupboard already and the 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 ones that you have in your cupboard you can't buy at the store you can't buy anything like that no, at the store, i'm sure no. and I, if you if i go to the farmer and he gets me a pig in the fall the pork chops and the you know the sausage that i make off of that and the hams that i cure off of that you're not gonna be able to find that in the store either yeah and i can do it in my yard the, <laughs> and for me, the fact that I, uh, you make your own kimchi, um, you, I don't even know anywhere that you could buy that. Uh, locally. You can find it in uh, organic sections in Kroger, but you have to look for it, and, yeah. and they it's really expensive. And it's a little jar, yeah. <laughs> it's a really small jar yeah. for a lot of money, and for that amount of money, you can go buy the ingredients to make enough kimchi to last however long you want. Gallons of it, yeah. yeah. You're going to be able to make a lot of kimchi. Yeah. And you can eat it for every meal, and it's going to last you months, you know, instead of that jar for the same price. And I'm I'm big on fermented uh, foods because of just how good they are for you. Oh, yeah. They're Uh, they're great for your gut. uh, You take a bite of kimchi, and it just wakens up all your senses. Yeah. All of them. Your your nasal cavity starts to move. Your eyes water a little bit. You know, you you tingle. It's it's just a great thing. And it it makes you feel alive. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we were talking earlier about the program you're doing at the farmer's market Mm -hmm. and I I find that really interesting Um, and so if you want to explain that because and and for me the skill involved to be able to do that so (laughs) so um, basically um, what we do at the farmer's market um, we show up with propane tanks uh, a cooktop cast iron pans utensils and spices and we go around to all the farmers ask them what they have ask them if they'd like to you know have basically have the market buy a small amount of their product to give to us that we can take back over to our tent and make food and then what we do is we just go shopping when we get to the market <clears throat> and ask them for their ugly stuff. <laughs> like, hey, can we have that misshapen carrot over there? Right. Or can we have those ugly bulbous tomatoes that they're fine, they're just not pretty. Right. So we take them and we go to the our tent and cook it up and then give out samples to anybody that comes by and wants them. We pass out samples to the gardeners and all the vendors and we pass out samples to the customers. And basically what it is, we are a commercial that you can smell at the market. So when a, somebody comes up to us and goes, oh, what are you doing? Well, we're just here, here, try this, you know. We're just here cooking food, and we let them try it, and they, if they like it, they ask where we got it. 
And they ask what we did. So we tell them what we did, and we tell them, well, that's the farmer you can get it from. So then they can learn something that they might not have learned anywhere else. They can come here and, well, I don't know how to use a kohlrabi. Well, here, here's how you do it. And we show them how to clean it and cut it and cook it. And then they go over to the guy. They go over to the guy selling the kohlrabi, and they buy it. Yeah. Where they would have walked by before with the guy with the bison, he gave you Oh, yeah. a, A local bison farmer came up, and he was right next to me, and I told him what we did, and he gave me a piece of meat. So I cooked it, and I passed it out to everybody. And he said, well, next time I'm going to have to give you a porterhouse because I sold out of that particular type of meat because you were there to explain what to do with it, and we were right next to him. So, I mean, it's a win-win situation because I get to do what I want to do anyway and have fun with it. Yeah. And the, the, the vendors get to benefit from it because they kind of get a, a little bit of promo right there sure. and demo for people to, to learn about what they're growing, and then I point them in the right direction. Because I know I would probably look at the, the bison vendor and say, boy, that looks interesting, but I don't know if I want to spend money on that because I don't know what it will taste yeah, like. And but if they were to what... taste it first, yeah. if they were giving out samples, and oh. that's what happened, you know. And, and I, I love the idea that you guys go in there and and you figure it out on the spot. Totally on the fly, man. And it's it's uh, Iron Chef uh, <laughs> Farmer's Market. Yeah, it's like... Um... It's like you know street street art or something. It, you know, it, it really is. And that's what it is. It's it, basically my friends and I joke around about my my grill outside because it's made out of basically what what equates to junk metal and leftover cinder right. blocks, you know. But if you have a my friends and I have kind of adopted a way of cooking where if you have a place that can hold heat, you can cook. So yeah. all, all I need is a flame. You know, if I need to cook over candles, you get enough of them, I'll, I'll turn you out a meal. Right. And uh, it may not be Michelin quality, but it's going to be, it, you'll be able to eat it, you know. And, you know, even all my friends were in some way or another skilled in the kitchen. Because we all just, we all became friends catering together. So. Yeah. yeah. So now when we hang out and, you know, everybody gets hungry, you don't eat hot dogs and hamburgers. We eat, you know, filet mignon or, you know goat that was locally raised or you know it's it's just it's a whole different level of snacking yeah (laughs) Uh, i I know every time i've ever been at one of the the parties that you guys had the the food is off the hook oh especially with my family yes my brother is a chef my sister is a baker my both of my parents are whizzes in the kitchen um we come from a line of meat cutters on one side and and cooks and cooks on the other side. So I mean, when our family gets together, it's a, it's a let's see who can out share the other one, and just everybody brings their A game, and it turns out to be, you know, a pretty decent spread. We don't have normal things. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's there's potato salad, but there's also uh, goat ribs and you know uh, homemade salamis and stuff like that. You know, it's it's not just your regular picnic fare. Speaking of your family, it's interesting that that I've. I think I, I now I've met everybody in the family, but I've met everybody separately. Yeah. I met your dad because he works on my cars. Uh-huh. And then I met your mom because she's a nurse at the hospital where I, where I work. And then put two to, two together that that um, that they were married. And, yeah. and then um, I met your sister when she worked at the hospital. Uh-huh. I didn't realize that that was your sister or that was your mom's daughter. Uh-huh. And, and put the pieces together then... When I finally met you after that, and then I think I met your your brother at the graduation, at the graduation party. party. Yeah. But but I kind of encountered everybody separately, mm-hmm. um, all from the same family. And that's usually you know when you meet somebody from a family, you meet the other family meet members the through family. them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and everybody, it's it, you come from a from a really good family. Man. They're it's some a, good it, people. It's a fun family. It yeah, is. It's pretty fun. We all get together. Um, so this yeah this has to be an exciting time to be in food because there are just so many foodies out there it's it is really nice i've been in the restaurant industry for over 20 years now which is terrible to say out loud (laughs) but um it's it used to we used to be considered to help really yeah you know you were absolutely you were don't don't look at don't be seen and don't be heard just make sure the food comes out right right and now I hear more and more, you know, passing on the street or people that come in, they want us to talk to the chef. They think, oh, that's so cool, yeah. you know. It's kind of like being a rock star. Right. And it's it's nice for once. It's it's finally nice to have people appreciate what you're doing 
and then you know kind of trust you to do sure to do what you're doing you know and like we don't have American cheese in the restaurant right we don't have ketchup in the restaurant and people have asked for it at the beginning and I told them no we don't do that there's other stuff that you can get in place of that right to try it but you know it is nice to that people finally just kind of go okay well you know what you're talking about and we like what you're doing and, and I think that uh, uh, I mean I'm not so tapped into that world but it just seems like that uh, people really want that experience where as even as little as 10 years ago they really wanted something that they ordered it they knew what they were getting and now they have that sense of adventure and they Yes. The, the idea of trying a new dish mm-hmm. is um, going out to dinner is really about the food yeah. it is more so than the social interaction where you just happen to eat a meal and and you get the same thing every time it's to yeah, instead uh, of it being fodder it's more of an experience yeah yeah, yeah. it's 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 the main part of the evening is yeah, we're going to go very try cool. this dish it's very cool to be in this business now and then, you know especially we were talking about with wheeling being on an upswing yeah People just really coming coming outside their comfort zone and just appreciating things for what they are instead of trying to fit everything into their comfort box, you know. Which just expand it, expand your view, and it's just it's just, it's a really good time. Yeah, I I, <laughs> I think willing is um, experiencing that experiencing that renaissance in a lot of different areas. Mm-hmm. But um, you're definitely leading the charge, culinarily speaking, and um, yeah, I I try to just you. Know, Keep it honest, man. Like, I'm not, I don't think, I, I mean, yes, I'm doing stuff that's different, but just because I've, you know, read about other food cultures and, we, you know, Americans as a food culture, just, we're new. Like, we're, in, in a lot of respects, we're still trying to catch up to the open-mindedness of other food cultures. Sure. So, to be at a time where people are, you know, trying new things, it's, it's, I wouldn't say that I'm leading the charge, but I am kind of giving people trying to trying to at least make the general public realize that hey there's different things that you could try and sure you can you can do a, a business based around something that's a little different you don't have to do what everybody else is doing well I I, I think that's a very humble way to, <laughs> to look at it but but honestly I um, it takes a lot of guts to, to as far as I'm concerned to to even in the culture where people the climate where people are more open to it still to put things on the menu that people have not tried before and to to throw in these unique combinations and stand behind your product and and have faith that that if people taste this as much as it may not sound like something that they've ever heard of mm-hmm. that that you know that the people will like it and that's i think it's it it comes a lot from i mean i've worked in this area like i said over 20 years and in that time people have eaten the stuff that I've put out all the time and they enjoyed it. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that it's kind of got sidetracked in my brain. That was terrible. <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> well, I can see that the, the, the experience of having, but yeah, like it's just, yeah, I just really like, ha- I've built up a fan base. So like right. the people just, they, they trust that I'm, I put in the work. Yeah. To, to earn their respect, really, to earn the, the fact that, yeah, I know what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna get you sick, right. and, and I'm going to give you something that's delicious. Yeah. You know, that's my whole, you know, just make, that's, if I wanted to have, like, a, a code of ethics, it kind of starts with, just give people a good experience. Yeah. Number one, be clean, be safe, and then, other than that, be creative. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a draw, is, you know, people realize that I'm going to, I'm going to put out something that you're not used to. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's, it is such such a different dining experience from uh, where you go to a chain restaurant where you know what you're going to get no matter which one you stop in. You know what you're going to get before yeah. you walk in. Yeah. Like and, you go, oh, I know, I know their whole menu. Yeah. And I'm going to get this and I'm going to know exactly what it's going to taste like. You know. No matter where, yeah. And so this is like a, a 180 from that. And I mm-hmm. think that, that, um, that's really refreshing for me to see that that so many people appreciate it as well. Yeah, and uh, up and coming, we got the, a new menu rolling out, which is exciting. Yeah, um, we're gonna be switching over to some new summer flavors and um, kind of pushing some boundaries again. Yes. Um, the, I we I joke with my sous chef Audrey. I say, well, now that we've done this, we got to keep raising the bar on ourselves. Right. You know? um, 
we don't want to get stagnant. And uh, so it, 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 some days it's challenging because you go, well, what am I going to do now? Like, I, I put the bar, I set the bar so high for myself. <laughs> what do I got to do next? Um, but we're bringing we're bringing back a couple of old favorites that people liked as specials and um, doing some you know some raw tuna stuff. And some nice. poke. We're doing a tuna poke parfait, which will be really cool. Which is actually Audrey's, um, and uh, you know taking some of the classics that people have gotten accustomed to and adding a new twist to it or preparing it a different way. You know, adding some new options on the menu. You can customize things a little more now. Um, just very refreshing as a chef to be able to make those changes and have people support you. you sure, because and I'm sure that uh, um, you know the safe bet would go. Well, this is popular on the menu. We're never taking it off. Oh so. well, we actually have a menu. I'm not going to tell you which one it is, <laughs> but there is an item on the me- uh, a menu item that is very popular. I sell a lot of it, yeah. and it's coming off of the menu for the simple fact that we'll just try something else. Yeah, you know, and I'm still going to have the means to do that sure so if somebody comes in because they drove you know i drove from middle of ohio because someone told me about this pulled pork sandwich yeah i'll still be able to do it but it's not gonna be on the menu yeah you know that's oh i see i, I didn't realize that that's <laughs> um that's really nice that uh mm-hmm. um that you're thinking that far ahead of of your oh your absolutely and we you know we have a vegan following which is funny because i consider myself to be more of a a meat specialist right right but um i do recognize that there are friends out there of people who like meat that don't eat meat right and usually i've learned in circles that the person with the most dietary restrictions chooses where they eat right where the whole group eats right so if i can give vegans an option they they can go oh we can get this stuff here and then all the people that eat meat can go oh we can get this stuff here too then they're all going to be happy. And, you know? It's a it's a complete dining experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you have dietary restrictions, because we do everything ourselves, we yeah. don't phone anything in, other than tomato products, because I don't have I don't have somebody growing me that many tomatoes that I need. Right. Um, but if you have a dietary restriction, let us know. And I like to have that open line of communication with if you, um, I I can't have gluten. What do you have? Well, I have a couple options that we can do. You yeah. know. It's just, uh, you want to try to accommodate, accommodate everybody, especially people with more restrictions to their diet because they're probably getting the same old boring stuff everywhere else. Yeah. If we, yeah, if you have a dietary restriction, mm-hmm. uh, and I mean, for me, I have a certain self-imposed dietary yes. restriction yeah, where yeah. I'm just trying to eat healthy. So mm-hmm. um, a lot of times there's certain restaurants, why bother? Because I, yeah. I know there's very few things there that that I can eat from just the standpoint of I don't want to put crappy food in my body. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to be able to come in and, and have uh, the ability to, to really... Yeah, we'll be, doing a a, we'll be doing a grilled garden platter with as much local vegetation as I can get, yeah. really. Uh, we'll be doing a vegan kimchi bowl, which will be just vegetables and rice and our kimchi. Um, we'll be doing uh, a detox salad, which is nice. kind of a fun thing to yeah. serve at a bar. You know, brewery. Um, we kind of joke around and say you got to detox before you retox. <laughs> That's right. But it's it's a really delicious vegetable and fruit and nut salad with kale and broccoli, cauliflower, you know, cranberries, and then our house dressing. And it's just it's it's fun to eat because there's a lot of cool things in it. Even for somebody like myself who I wouldn't pass up meat to eat a vegetable. Right. But this stuff I actually crave sometimes, so I you know, got to get me some. Well, and I think the the thing is your food is healthy because just by the fact that it's it's so much of it is natural. Yeah, um, I don't. We don't use we we cook in olive oil and you know, vegetable oil. Uh, we don't have a fryer. We don't have a, a char grill putting a lot of smoke up it. We have a smoker, but that's vented, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, and but fresh. we do every, we do everything. I, I go shopping at, when a, when it's seasonal. I go to the farmers markets to get my vegetables. So, as much as I can, really. So, th- if you start with healthy ingredients, yeah, you really, you really don't eat. You don't want to put too much stuff in it. You really don't have to. Like, if you just let Mother Nature's ingredients speak for themselves, your real job as a chef is just to be able to put the pieces together. 
she's got all the parts. Yeah. You know, everything's there that you need. You just got to put them together. Right? That's it. Um, the, the other thing I like about the, the experience is, and, and I told this story on a couple podcasts ago about an experience I had in Pittsburgh. Um, and you have to go back and listen to the episode with Kyle, um, Eddie, and Robbie for the name of the restaurant because I'm not going to mention it again. But, uh, you know, they had rabbit and venison on, on, the, on the menu, which I thought was cool. And, and I got the, the pan seared duck and it was $45 and there was nothing exceptional about it. It was a piece of duck meat thrown on a grill, um, except for the fact that it was too salty and there was two tablespoons of some minced potato thing. And um, the pretentiousness of it <laughs> was so annoying that, that literally the food that you're serving is a very reasonable price and, and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a very casual atmosphere. And it's a great dining experience. Thanks, man. Uh, and, and this place, I, I just could not believe the pretentiousness behind. And I don't like I, I don't like when I'm pretentious, and I try not to be. And I it's just one of my pet peeves. And I just thought, how dare they <laughs> charge me forty five dollars yeah. for the t the palm of the hand? The whole meal would. I was literally as hungry when I left there as when I came in. Yeah. And I would have been okay with all that if the food was exceptional exceptional yeah, it needs to, if it's that yeah it needs to be way out way above way above and i i can't and even i could see you pay a little bit of money for an atmosphere and and for a nice setting and nice china or whatever but there was nothing about it that was exceptional yeah, it needs to and, and, anyway, yeah. Man. and 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 i come down to to willing brewing and and um this amazing food that you can't get anywhere on the planet and, <laughs> and it doesn't break your wallet. And that's probably my highest compliment is it. And, and it's right there in Willing, West Virginia. Well, man, I'm a, I'm a home taught chef yeah. who learned how to cook down home family stuff. I just have a creative brain and took my education in culinary arts further. Yeah. You know, so I have those roots and it's got to taste good. Number one. Yeah. And don't try to candy coat it, really. Yeah. Like this, if this is what it is, tell people this is what it is. But you know, I'm doing something to it that takes skill and it takes a little bit of knowledge and effort, and that's why it costs this much. Yeah. But when you eat it, you're gonna go, oh, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, at least. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I've eaten so many of the the things you have where literally, you it you just want to eat slowly and savor it because <laughs> <laughs> it, you don't it, want it to be over you don't I've, want it to be over i've had dishes like that before. yeah, yeah. And, uh, um and even just some of the, the simpler things that you've given me where you just you're like oh man i'm getting towards the end this is this is disappointing because because it's almost over <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean if if you think about food like that instead of just you know being something that you need to consume to keep going right it becomes a little more a little more special. Yeah. You know? And, and, and it should be, especially um, when you go out to eat. When, when I eat at home, I do kind of eat for... <laughs> for um, I'm, yeah. When I eat at home, when I eat at home, it's it's really... I have a wonderful girlfriend who knows how to cook. She I'm does. Wise. But if she's not around, I'm usually eating like a cold cut sandwich or a bag of chips. Right. I, I eat terrible for a chef. And everyone's like, well, why don't you weigh like 500 pounds because yeah. all this good food? You don't want to smell it. Yeah. Like when I get done with a 12 hour shift in the kitchen, I don't want to come home and smell meat. Yeah. And, and I work with chicken breast. I don't want to do that. It's like the, the mechanic who comes home and, oh, can you work on the car? Yeah. No, I don't want to do that. But so I, so I just like that instead of it being just something to consume, people are starting to, it's, it is an art form. Yeah. It's, you know, and they're appreciating mm -hmm. it for that. I, I know um, it's funny because as a filmmaker, I've, never shot video i don't think of any of my nieces and nephews birthday parties i don't when i when i'm at any kind of function uh, i mean i'll see people have their phone out and they'll be filming a concert or a party or something mm -hmm. uh, i never film anything when we're not making a movie because uh, yeah i just have, have uh yeah no interest in it you don't want to do it yeah they, they said that uh, uh the one guy from this old house i think with norm that uh, uh his house is just 
incomplete all over the place. Oh, yeah. All these started projects that he never uh-huh. finished because after working on this old house all day, the last thing he wants to do is uh, come home and, and uh, work on his own house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but there are days like today, you know, my mom and dad were coming over for the birthday party and yeah. I was having, we were having friends over for that and I grilled meat. Yeah. I, I do the meat here on the, on the brick grill outside. But uh, it is a, it's a pretty nice teamwork when we get together on a meal. Well, I, and I think that that's one of the to me where I, I know that you just you love cooking because you've come over to my house before for a barbecue and oh, you've yeah. cooked. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. I'm I'm glad you did because <laughs> I mean I make pork chops all the time and um, you were cooking the same pork chops that I buy all the time, but they didn't taste the way they do when I cook them. <laughs> And like, Sarah, like I said, man, uh, I messed up a bunch of pork chops. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, and 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 you're also a pretty good teacher because I remember as you were cooking them, you were explaining to me what you were doing and and how in the future. And I probably forgot what it was because that was kind of in the fall last year. Yeah. So I need a refresher. But um, yeah. and just naturally, as you were cooking, you were sharing the information. Yeah, and um, and that comes from growing up in the kitchen with my parents and my grandparents, like they were doing that to me so i just kind of thought that's how you cook <laughs> when you're cooking about when you're cooking something and you're prepping something you talk about it yeah and this is what i'm doing this is why i'm doing it so it's just ingrained in my dna that if someone's standing within earshot i'm going to be talking about what i'm doing you know and if someone can learn how to do something great yeah a lot of chefs are worried about people stealing steal my technique go yeah. ahead please yeah please yeah. Or come work for me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I think that uh, um, you're not is competitive at all. The, no, man. The more the more people that are getting out and cooking things, the more people are going to appreciate what they're putting in their mouth, and then maybe think about instead of going to that chain restaurant, going to the local shop and seeing what they're doing. Right. You know, that's it's not a competition. It, I, I yeah, that's I kind of think that same way. Um, yeah, I'm going to be doing this whether there's going to be 10 people in the restaurant yeah. in the day or there's going to be 1,000 people come through the restaurant or I'm not going to be at a restaurant. I'm still going to be cooking like this yeah. for my family and friends. You know. Well, and the, the nice thing about having um, you know, peers that, that, that you can learn from, but also you know, uh, I like that we just uh, recently uh, over the winter met up with these group of filmmakers uh, from Martin's Ferry Don, uh, Brenton, and um, I can't remember his name because because uh, I'm on the spot. Yeah. Keith and uh, from the Straight to Hell crew, and I mean, it challenges me to, to keep up with with my peers, Absolutely. and I I've learned a lot from them, and um, even just the other guys that I work with, um, when they make a really good film that they directed, it makes me reminds me that like. Yeah, you need to step it no, up. You got to do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that it friendly competition yeah, is, is always is always good and inspires uh, mm-hmm. everybody. And um, this probably the most reoccurring theme on the podcast has been that that we live in a in an area that there's not haters. When you're successful, people are glad oh, to see yeah, you man. succeed. Yeah, because if someone's successful, it's just going to draw more people here. Yeah, and then you know that just helps everybody. And there's a lot of really good collaborations. We were talking about ways that me and you could collaborate um, with what you're doing and, and with what I do with the film. And, oh, yeah. Um, and I see that spirit of cooperation where people take the thing that they're passionate about and that, that it's their expertise and they, they combine that skill, kind of the way you do with the farmer's market, um, where People bring whatever it is that they are passionate about to the table, and they collaborate on things. And, and both parties, both benefit, parties yeah. benefit, and the, the public benefits from mm-hmm. from their efforts. And um, yeah, because we and, and again with this area, we are fully capable as a com, as communities up and down this river valley to com, be completely self sustainable. Yeah, we could do just about everything you need because we're hardworking, down to earth folks. And, we've and got, that's kind of why I like this area, but it's also another reason that doing what I'm doing in the culinary world is kind of tough, in the, at least it used to be tough in this area, it's because people were very, you know, determined and, you know, set in their ways. Right. You know. I, it's, and it's nice to see that, uh, um, and I think it's the, the whole 
country in general, maybe even the whole world, where people are starting to kind of come out of that, where, where they're being open-minded. But mm -hmm. I think this is one of the more progressive communities that, that I know about. What I, what I think is we were all raised with that hard-nosed, determined you know, will to do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. And that spawned a good work ethic, and then it created a bunch of people who were creatively thinking and became artists. Yeah. So you have that that good, strong stubbornness, almost to call yeah. it, of doing things the way you want to do them, but then we also have the people who took that and turned it into an art form, too. So now you have artists who have that same work ethic to get behind what they're doing and just do it because they want to do it, not because it's going to make them famous or get them rich, you know what I mean? Yeah, to get the praise, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a good point because... Um, Definitely, it takes effort to, to achieve something. And it's one thing to have a goal and even have a lot of talent. But at the end of the day, you got to put your ass into it yeah. and, and work yeah. really hard. you got to have the scars on your fingers yeah. and the hairless knuckles and the grease burns and which, you know, the knife callus. you got to have all that to be able to confidently tell people, yeah, this is yeah. how you do it, you know. So even as a leader in the kitchen, before I was the boss... I had to be able to do the things that I was telling people underneath me how to do. Right. Because if I'm going to be your boss and I tell you to do something, I should be able to do it exactly the way I want it done. Yeah. And show you how to do it. So that's, that's I've had a lot of bosses that didn't do that to me in my coming up through the culinary world. So I made a vow to say, if I'm going to tell somebody to do something, they're going to be able to know that I can do it. Yeah. So. And the, the, um, like you said, you, you made a lot of hams before you... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I ruined a lot of hams. You ruined a lot I of got hams. One. Yeah. Um, that takes a lot of effort and, and a lot of uh, uh, perseverance to, to not to say, uh, hams aren't for me. Because I, uh -huh. I know for me, because I'm I... am going to buy my ham now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't have the passion for cooking, so I might try to cure ham. I, don't, I can't imagine that I would. But if I did, <laughs> and it didn't turn out right the first time, I'd be like, hell with this. Probably wouldn't waste yeah, another yeah, two yeah. weeks of ham. Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, that, that's where I think having a real passion for what you're doing. But I just uh, really wanted people to taste my product, and no matter what it was, to taste it and go, wow. Yeah. That, that's all chefs, whether they want to admit to it or not, are after that instant gratification. Man. Yeah. They're after that person who puts that first bite in their mouth, and they, you know, they just completely roll their <laughs> eyes back, and they just... They, they clutch their, you know, there's, oh my goodness, that was, that's exactly what I wanted or I've been craving this. Like I did earlier when I tried the yeah, steak. Yeah, we had <laughs> the steak in the ribs, man. Like, if you can make a grown man do this sound right here, oh, I mean, you've done your job. That's, that's right. You know, and all chefs, whether they want to admit to it or not, are, are after that, because we can instantly see the results of our labor. Yeah. You know, if you take any other job, you're not going to see the payoff immediately right I can put out a plate in 10 minutes walk out watch that person take that bite and love it and that's instant yeah you know, I, that's just that's really what it's all about man. and and um, and as much as it's something that, that you may be prepared in 10 minutes it's also something that you've worked at for a lifetime well it took me 10 minutes to put your plate in front of you yeah. but, but there, were, there were scale. weeks there were weeks of prep for that dish beforehand and there were years of learning that skill yeah put into that 10 minutes yeah. so it's not just you know the 10 15 minutes yeah. from the time you order to the time you're eating it there's you know there are people behind the scenes doing a lot of stuff you don't even know yeah. about and, and i would say just from some of the different creations that that i i've seen you come up with that um the amount of hours that went into the the the, the egg yolk for example yeah. um how many hours you put into just coming up with that and figuring out how to do it and dialing it in to the to we got to the moment where you sliced me off a piece of it and I put it in my mouth and I I, I never tasted anything like this before in my life. Um, it's, it's a it's a good combination of creativity and and thinking outside the box and patience and practice patience. And practice and That's knowledge a good one. That's and a good one. Um, yeah it's I, I've I've been a big fan of yours since so people are listening thinking. Boy, he spent an hour kissing a guy's ass <laughs> about food, but, but I, I, I don't care because I'm just a super fan. Um, not not just of eating the food, but the but the way you approach it. I mean, 
from the start, uh, for people that don't know, you're dating my good friend Sarah, and she had talked about you for a long, long time. And when we finally met, I was just really struck by um, how passionate you are about what you do. And um, I learned a long time ago that if you do what you want, like to do, and what you love to do, and what you're passionate about, you really don't have to work. Right. And I also learned that you have to work to do anything, really. Yeah. So you have to put a lot I of kind of put them together, and if I'm gonna have to work, I'm gonna do something that I'm good at, which I learned. It, was, it I wasn't good at cooking immediately. Yeah. You know, it took a lot. Like I said, a lot of messing up stuff, and a lot of my parents going. Well, we might have to order pizza, maybe. <laughs> right. You know, okay, all right, maybe we'll get pizza. But, you know, that all just practice, man. And, and I think uh, just finding that thing in life that, that you really love to do, um, I think I found things that, that I definitely love to do. And I think for people like us, we're, we're really fortunate because I. You can go a lifetime and not find that thing. There's that a lot you're of people about. who spend their time in a cubicle, yeah. at a desk, man. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Couldn't and, do it. I hope anybody that's listened to any of these podcasts, but particularly this one, if you don't have something that you're passionate about, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. It just means you haven't found it. And keep, I, look, keep, keep looking. Keep looking. Yeah, keep looking. Try new things. Um, explore something that you have a little interest in, um, because you don't you don't always know yeah. that you're going to fall in love with it the first time. Uh, I didn't set out to be a chef. Yeah. I, be, I ended up just becoming a chef. Yeah. It's kind of like the mafia. It sucked me in. I couldn't <laughs> get out of it. I, but uh, it ended up working out for me, you know? I When I started filmmaking, I had no desire to... The first couple things I edited, I wasn't thinking that I'm going to learn how to do this so that I can make film someday. I was just kind of goofing around, and then I found out that I liked it. And yeah. The more I did it, and then at some point it did become something that, that I became passionate about. And... Um, I'm really getting into the podcasting thing now, yeah. and um, I didn't know that I would really like it when I started. Um, I just thought it'd be fun to try, and maybe I'll do four or five, and if it's no fun, I won't do it anymore, but yeah. uh, turns out that I, I'm enjoying <laughs> it. Turns out it's kind of cool. It is cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, conversations like this, um, you know, we hang out with BS all the time, and we mm. talk about a lot of these similar things, but... It's something about the fact that we have two microphones in front of us that that it's a little bit more of an intense conversation. It's and, professional, man. Well, <laughs> I go as deep as I can on the professionalism. Yeah, but yeah. I'm still yeah. wearing short pants. So. And that's all right. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm wearing uh, slippers, so we're good. That's that's the casualness <laughs> of the James Woodarsic Experimental Podcast. A yeah. um, couple things that I, I wanted to, to mention. So you do some interesting uh, forms of cooking, uh, the smoking, the dehydration, but um, there's a whole thing with camping and outdoor cooking that, oh, that we had talked about. Um, you know, my dad and I and my brother um, just kind of over the years built up a collection. It was mostly for dad's birthdays and father's days and Christmas. We'd get him cast iron. Well, then he started getting into fishing trips and getting collecting pieces of you know, stove tops and you know, one propane burners and smaller burners, big burners. And uh, for my brother's bachelor party, it kind of culminated in a three-day bachelor weekend. And we lit a fire on Friday morning and did not cook anything except over that fire for three days. Wow. So we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks and everything over the campfire. So my dad and brother and I kind of joke around that, you know, we could have a business just doing camping catering, you know. I think we I could, definitely could. I could, we could turn out, a, you know, three meals a day for however long you want, wherever you want, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that is, because uh, um, most people, when I think of camping out and cooking, it's a hot stick. Dog on a hot dog on a stick, yeah. 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 And, and No, we did uh, biscuits and sausage gravy, and we did grilled venison, we had steaks and baked potatoes and corn and everything else, man. Yeah. Sitting to, around a hole in the ground. Yeah, <laughs> the, the ability to like turn out the, that kind of a meal over a, an open fire. Yeah, we did scotch eggs over a campfire. Um, fresh smoked bacon that came out of the smoker at one house and came over warm, and then we sliced it nice. and put it in the skillet that day. Yeah, we it's it's become a a, a rustic art form in our family is being sure. able to cook. 
cook high-end things with minimal equipment. Well, I'll t- you, you definitely embodied the DIY spirit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, yes, you really do. Uh, the, uh, the 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 makeshift, I guess you would call it, uh, grill that you have out there. But it's cool. It makeshift is the nicest word everyone, anyone's ever used to describe it. Yeah, makeshift. But yeah, it's cinder blocks, man. You just need you need most of a hole. You just need a, you just need a vessel to have heat. Well, yeah, use what you got. And, and that's that's such a great way to, to approach things. So where you say, I don't really need to go out and buy a grill. You you have the knowledge of what you need to mm-hmm. to put to put the flame or to put the heat to the to the food. Mm-hmm. And you look around what you have available and 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 you build it. And yeah. um, and that's probably more durable than any gas grill that anybody having. And in, in, oh, your gas grill is going to wear out. Yeah. Those center blocks that I have sitting out there in a pile, they're yeah. going to be all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, what, uh, because I got here late after you are done using that, what did you use to heat it? Was it charcoal? Was it wood? Lump, it- lump uh, hardwood charcoal, the oh, stuff okay. that's not the briquettes, the big chunks of actual hardwood. We made our own charcoal. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I, yeah, I, I think I remember you telling me about uh, um, making your own charcoal. How do, oh. how do you do that? Uh, basically, you take your lumps of wood and you put them in a like a metal box where you can cut off the airflow and you put that box in a fire and then when it just starts to smoke roll out of the box you take it off and you have charcoal in there so you basically you want to blacken the whole bits of chunks of wood that you put in the box blacken them without oxygen so they're not actually burning they're just turning into coal wow yeah and then you just that's what you grill on And and it's much much better like my dad just cut down a pear tree, so if I'm, I'm seasoning that wood so that later on I can smoke bacon over pear wood. It's just it's it, fun to get st- everything local. Like I try to do everything as close to home as possible. And the fruit trees are what you want fruit to use for trees, smoking. cherry, apple, pear. That's what I use. I mean, you can use hickory and oak and all kinds of other stuff, but I just like to stick to the cherry wood, apple wood, pear wood. And they, they actually have a, a, a certain flavor. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely what you use. You, we, I've cooked ribs over pecan shells before because that's what we had. Yeah. So <laughs> it was right after Christmas and everybody's you know, bowl of nuts that they yeah. have with the nutcrackers. We saved all the shells and you know saved some of the nuts that went on sale. And we were smoking ribs and chicken over your pecan shells that's so awesome basically you just want to stay away from pine because it's real acidic and you don't want to not a good flavor you don't want to get that on your meat if you have to cook something in the wilderness and you need to light a fire and there's pine yes do yeah. it but if you're trying to turn out some nice brisket or something then yeah. you don't want to do you don't want to do pine well brother this has been a, a, a great conversation and as always, I, uh, as always. W- w- what day does the uh, the new menu launch? New menu rolls out June first, and we'll be uh, that's a Thursday, I believe, and we'll be uh, working the bugs out that whole weekend to make sure we optimize the dining experience for the customers. But uh, so new menu rolls out June first, yeah. So if you're listening to this, uh, Thursday, good. June first, yeah. come down to the Brewing Company, and before that, come get something off off the old menu. And, yes, and then. Come down June first, and you can get something off the new menu. It's Willing Brewing Company, and what's the address? Twenty two forty seven Market Street, Willing. And down in the heart of Center Market. Oh, yeah. um, get some craft brews, and then um, we had the. I got to see Sarah's brother Josh, who is part of Brewkeepers, and I'm not. I, I hate to admit it because it's not fashionable these days. I'm not much of a beer drinker, but I easily drank two of those beers. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're pretty delicious. It's it's yeah. ridiculously good and and super good. There's so much good. There's good so stuff many going good on. things coming out of Wheeling right now. Yeah. So just yeah. if you're not from Wheeling, yeah. come to Wheeling and check yeah. us out because yeah. we got a lot of good things happening. Get good food and beer at Wheeling Brewing. Get good good beer also at uh, Brewkeepers. Check out the market, the shops, the antique shops, yeah. Coleman's Fish, you know, yeah. Valley Cheese, which I get some of my product from. There's a whole lot of things. There's the uh, bakery. On. The uh, yeah, Center Market Bakery does my flatbreads. Yeah. Uh, they're right in the Center Market. So there's a lot of things that you can come and get everything you need. And Later one, Gator. One couple, a crepe few, and... few blocks, you could plan your whole day. Yeah. 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 That, uh, um, we can't say enough about what everybody's doing here in the uh, Ohio Valley, but 
Um, when it comes to food, you're my guy. Thanks. Man. And um, when it comes to being someone that's passionate about what they're doing and just being an artist, um, it doesn't get any better than that, man. Appreciate and, uh, it. And so that I think that's why we've always hit it off so well. Oh, yeah. uh, I dig what you're doing too. Thanks, man. For sure. All right. Thanks for being on, brother. Hey, no problem, buddy. All right, everybody. Till the next time. Goodbye.